Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this series that we've been doing, myself and my guest here in the studio, Dr. Bill Warner, on the status of women in Islam. So far, we kind of like laid uh, out the ground rules of where the teachings come from, and also we discussed briefly some of the troubling teachings that are found there. Now, uh, we, we last time we closed by showing a graph that uh, Dr. Bill Warner did in terms of if you study the status of woman according to the Quran, that's the word of Allah, and the Hadith, the word of Muhammad, whether they are treated equal or they have high status or low status, and the slide I think is in front of us as a sample here from the Hadith, I think you can see that usually their low status uh, consumes most of the teaching that are found in the Hadith, or let's go to the next slide from the Quran as you can see. Why is this crucial? This actually flies in the face of the claim that Islam <laughs> came and elevated the status of women and made them equal to man. And with that in mind, I want to really in, engage uh, my guest here into the conversation. So, Bill, welcome back. And uh, what say you about this? Well, we're going to get into some details which are uh, slightly funky, to use a hip word, because one of the things we need to talk about, I've discovered in listening to people what they know about Islam, in particular about Muhammad, there's one thing that most of them know about. He married Aisha when she was six and consummated the marriage when she was nine. Right. <clears throat> and so the reason this is important has nothing to do with Muhammad except for the fact he's the perfect example of a human being, the perfect Muslim. So this means that it is possible for a Muslim today to marry basically a child, a prepubescent child. Which we will talk about it also. So this to me is, when I first read this, I can actually remember reading the first time I read the Hadith, I was like, wait a minute. Did, no, that's what it says. Six and nine. Right. Yeah. And before we get into the marriage issue, uh, last time we also mentioned something about Muhammad mis making the claim um, uh, to a woman who asked him a question about the difference between inheritance uh, given to man versus woman. And his response was that women are deficient in their brain. Here's another uh, tradition that says the similar thing, but this one is even more vicious, actually, in its teaching. This one is found in uh, Sahih Bukhari. And it says, Allah's apostle once said to a group of women, I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. Now notice, you are deficient in thinking intellectually, and you're deficient also in your religious duties. All right? A cautious, sensible man could be led astray by some of you. So now the man is the poor guy, you know? His temptation comes from the woman, basically. She's the cause of the problem. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> and at some point, he did say that about Eve. He says it was because of Eve, you know, and what she did, that basically, men now are led astray because women now can also be tempted and can cause someone to stumble because Adam, poor Adam, you know, he fell. was helpless. Absolutely. He couldn't do anything about it. Couldn't control his instincts. Absolutely. And uh, continuing on, the woman asked, Oh, Allah's apostle, what is deficient in our intelligence and religion? So here's what he says. He said, Is it not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? It so, is. From his point of view, the fact that it's it's a uh, mathematical equation, two equal one, that means the two are half. Uh, each right. one of them are half <clears throat> that one. They replied in the affirmative. He says, this is the deficiency of your intelligence. And then the next part, is it true, isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menaces, basically, or menstruation? And the woman replied in affirmative. He says, this is your deficiency in your religion. Now, if you think about it on the surface, about the second answer, at least, you would say, well, even the, you know, the law, you know, the book of Moses talks about things like this, you know, women go into isolation and things like that. That's not the point. The women that we're talking about, the Israelites, are saved, and they're saved by the grace of God. They're chosen, right? It's not going to impact their work and their deeds. Islam is a religion of works. And yes. if you don't do certain things, you're losing points. So what is Muhammad saying? You are losing points. You're not equal to us. 
Bill, didn't Muhammad say he saw the majority of the hellfire to be women? It was mostly filled with women, I believe it goes. That's, so, so he's kind of like affirming, uh, an affirmative here about the fact that you don't pray too much and fast too much. Sadly, you lose a lot of points and it will result in different destiny. The other thing when I read this hadith was this. <clears throat> First, the Quran says they can't do the prayers when they're having their periods. Then they turn around and say, that's proof that you're inferior. It's like, wait a minute. What if you didn't tell her that she couldn't pray when she was having her period? Would she suddenly be religiously better? That's right. That's right. I mean, it's it's just, uh, to me, it's very disturbing, you know, when you read things like this, but it's more disturbing how it's being explained also. Oftentimes, it's, uh, it's almost like there is no regard to the feelings and emotions of women and treating them really with the respect that they deserve. But, of course, in the mind of the person who's answering, he's going to say, well, that's what Muhammad says. Exactly. That's what the Quran says, which goes back to your point earlier about do we learn about Islam from a Muslim or from the sources? I say we trust the sources. Right. And you call them what, professor? I call them you, the two student. You need to be a student of Professor Allah and Dr. Muhammad. Yeah. They're the, they're the ones who dictated to you what you ought to do. Exactly. And so... Let's go back again. We started off in this series saying how easy it was to learn about Islam. Let me repeat it. You just have to know what it, Muhammad said and did and what's in the Quran. Absolutely. I'm trying to look now for another teaching. Um, believe it or not, uh, Hadith also teaches that women are deficient in their gratitude towards their husbands, for instance. This is true. You're not grateful. That's right. So here is the Hadith tradition that it says from Bukhari as well. Woman are ungrateful to their husbands and are ungrateful for the favors and good deeds done to them. I mean, one would argue done to them by their husband, actually. I mm -hmm. mean, since that's the context. If you have always been good to one of them, now he's making the case that if you're good to any of the women, technically speaking, and then she sees something in you, she will say, I have never received any good from you. He paints a very bad picture. That women are not grateful. And they're complaining all the time. Right. And they, they will never appreciate, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you, you read all of Sayyid Bukhari, correct? Yes. How did you feel about things like this when you came across them? Well, I was irritated to the point of being actually irritated is too light a word because this is subjugation of women. And I don't see that this, why is it necessary to subjugate them? I mean, that's my question question really I mean I've been married for a long time and I didn't have to subjugate my wife no we had to work out a lot of details but there was no attempt to subjugate it was a, a our working out issues was to achieve harmony not subjugation that's right and you know uh, one can even argue that the status of women actually in Islam went downward not upward for a simple reason you can observe that the wife of Muhammad the first wife Khadija was a businesswoman yes I mean, how many business women these days can you find in Islamic settings as opposed to Western culture, for instance? Almost none. I mean, very low percentage. What does that say about the fact that they feel probably not comfortable competing in such an environment or you never know how they will be treated, actually? Now, I'm not saying they don't have jobs. I'm not saying there are no business women, but they're not that prominent. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. You know, and that's... That shows basically if they feel there is equality, they wouldn't have really be such a low number. Mm -hmm. They all would have ventured into doing business. Another thing, you know, now women are different deficient in their witness. You know, this is the Quran itself that teaches something like this, which is, you know, the cause for that hadith. The witness of woman, basically, according to the Quran, two women equal the witness of one man. I mean, if the God of Islam himself is saying clearly, women are, you know, half basically the authority, let's say, half the wisdom, half the intelligence, half the capacity of man, then how can a, a Muslim man react to this? And how can a Muslim woman react to this without recanting their faith? If you want to follow Islam, you know, Bill, that's the teaching. That's what forces you to behave and act. I think what most people do is they just try to ignore it. Pretend it doesn't exist. <clears throat> right. Because Muslims also feel some pressure from Western society. 
And so there are some, indeed some women who are wanting more equality within the marriage. Doesn't mean they get it, but at least they want it. And that's an excellent point because, uh, I mean, I'm sure you observe this, that Islam in the West is totally different than Islam in the Middle East, for instance. Because Muslims in the Middle East are empowered by the majority of the culture. Right. Here, being a minority, you don't want to look back, right? I mean, right. I mean, let's talk about the translation of the Quran. You know, I like your example. What is the, uh, you know, the measuring rod that you use if the translation is good or bad? Do they beat her or beat her lightly? That's chapter 4, verse 34. 34. The Arabic says, beat your wives. Some of the translators now, because it's an embarrassing thing, they say, beat her lightly. With the word lightly, it's not even there in Arabic. Exactly. And what would it mean to beat them lightly? Oh, they'll, they'll tell you all kinds of stories. You know, they use like a small stick, Twig. you know, like a, something that has to do like a brush toothpick. your teeth with or toothpick, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it's. I, I always say, why beat him, beat them anyway? What's the point behind that? I mean, uh, and you see, because Muslims are honest enough to feel like they're stuck with the teaching, they can't tell you, oh, we're not going to use this hadith anymore. It doesn't apply. Or this verse is canceled. They can't, they can't come up with things like mm -hmm. this because there is no precedence for that. Right. And Islam, as you, uh, uh, you know, rightly, uh, you know, uh, stated that before, it, its sources are timeless sources. This is something we need to repeat. The examples of Muhammad are not just historical examples. They're prescriptions on how to act today. <clears throat> that is, you're supposed to act today just like it's 632 and you're living in Medina. That's the goal. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, Bill, you know, um, I would like to uh, talk about, um, sadly, marriage and divorce, but I feel like maybe this should be uh, in, a, in a, a, a brand new episode that is dedicated to that okay. because it's a deep topic and, um, you know, we'll try to give the introductory kind of material about this. So is there anything else we want to add to at least the status of women being deficient, you know, um, from your own experience, your own interactions, you know, with others, you know, uh, all over the world when you travel? Well. The doctrine is there, but what, what I take some pleasure in is that even in the Middle East, there's beginning to be some pressure where women are now more equal. <clears throat> the Saudis are going to let a woman drive a car, can you imagine? <clears throat> right, and uh, just recently also the decision was made that uh, basically um, a woman doesn't need a guardian, you know, the guardian law. In other mm -hmm. words, um, what, what that, that means is like if you want to travel just from one city to the other, or you want to fly somewhere, you have to have a male guardian with you. That could be your brother, husband, of course, father, something to that extent, because, you know, uh, you can look at it as a protection, you know, said so that that's not, that's noble. You know, you want to protect your daughter. You want to protect, you know, your wife. But the idea, can she travel alone if you're not available? No. The law prohibited that. Now they have lifted that ban. How do they justify doing that? Well, you know, um, it's a tension that is taking place, you know, trying to modernize and fit with the rest of societies. And at the same time, it's really going to cause a tension between, uh, you know, government and authority, religious authorities, because the religious authorities are not going to be happy about something like that, of course, because they know the teaching of Islam doesn't permit something like that. It's got to be, I say, I'm not living in that society, but it's got to be interesting to see how these tensions and play out. Yeah. Because on one hand, Islam is expanding into Europe and America, but on the other hand, it's being nibbled at in the back That's right. are now. That's right. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, with that uh, said, uh, next time, uh, most likely, will be the last episode uh, of this series, Woman in Islam. We are going to address the topic of marriage, the topic of polygamy, the topic of divorce, the topic of child marriage the topic of the fact that women are sexual toys for pleasure in heaven, you know, not necessarily on earth, which we will address, and things of that nature. So, you know, uh, stay tuned, buckle up, and wait for the next episode. And my prayer is that if you're sharing these videos with your female Muslim friend, that you need to pray about this, you need to be gentle on how to handle it, don't expect them, just because they're watching a video like this, that means they're going to recant Islam. Don't be surprised if they even affirm the teaching of Islam. Don't be even more surprised if they attacked me or Bill or both of us, because remember, 
they are in a pickled position. They have to either recant Islam and go along with what you're expecting him to uh, behave like or assume, you know, logical conclusion to, uh, to stand up for themselves, which they can't if they want to live according to the teaching of Islam, or they're going to have to affirm the teaching of Islam and attack those who are attacking it. Either way, they are in a tough position. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.